the very, very competitive practices that we would have at the Hellenic College, which Dennis Johnson and, and Danny Ainge and, and Larry and Kevin and, and Chief were the starting five, but with Jerry C. Sting and Scott Wedman and David Thirdkill and Bill Walton, we had a real competitive second team. And I, and I can just remember uh, being a rookie on that team and, and going home thinking, man, I get to play great basketball every day against great players and get paid. This is just the best thing in the world. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So we're all getting first time thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, can you make the pass? Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles spied at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 83. Thanks for joining me. Today, I'm excited to welcome Michigan's first Mr. Basketball, Michigan State University star, NBA champion, and now global coach, Sam Vincent, to the show. We cover Sam's fantastic on-court career and... As of this recording, he's more than 20 years of coaching and developing the game of basketball globally. Show notes for this episode, including links to numerous topics covered, are at inallairness.com slash 83. Now, onto the show. My guest today was Michigan's first Mr. Basketball. He starred as a high schooler, captured a state championship, and was a four-year standout at Michigan State University. He played seven NBA seasons, and since retiring from the league, he's coached and promoted the sport of basketball extensively. Sam Vincent, thanks for joining me. It's my pleasure, Adam. Uh, Pleasure to be here and pleasure to be on the show. I'm really excited to chat with you today, and I want to quickly thank a great friend of the show, Terrence Stansbury. Uh, He was a guest on episode 58 of the podcast, and he initially gave me the idea and helped us to connect today, so uh, I appreciate that, so thanks to Terrence. Terrence is a wonderful guy, so hopefully he's listening to the show, and I'll extend my regards to Terrence as well. Fantastic. Yeah, he's a great guy. He's very generous when we chatted, and uh, he helped uh, get in touch with yourself early on. Now, I'd always actually thought that your first name was Sam. However, I've since learned that your given name is James, and from what I've read, your nickname is courtesy of your older brothers. Now, how did Sam come to be? Well, uh, my given name is James, and... All throughout elementary and most of my early years, I was James. And somewhere along the way, and and you know, Adam, there's a few different stories. So I've read one of them. Yep. My older brothers have stories. My mom has stories. (laughs) You know, I I don't know if I've ever gotten any of them to really tell me the truth. (laughs) But I do know that the genesis of Sam did come from my oldest brother, uh, Johnny, uh, who was I believe one of the story goes watching a program on television uh, when we were kids and there was a character named Sammy. There was some personality similarities and uh, the older brother decided, hey, I'm just going to start calling you Sammy for now on. And so Sammy just kind of stuck for a while. And then from Sammy, it became Sam and and I never was able to get rid of it. So <laughs> I've had it for some time and it's lived on. And uh <laughs> And it's become a part of my name. Yeah, I never knew until I started looking into the background behind your um your career, and I was surprised to learn that wasn't your actual given name. Most listeners to this show would know that one of your older brothers, um, I think you're one of five brothers, your older brother Jay was a key member of the 1979 NCAA champion Michigan State Spartans, and of course he was college teammates with Magic Johnson, and then Jay would go on to play nine years in the NBA. Um, at what age did you become interested in basketball, Sam? I became interested in basketball around, I would say, seven or eight years old. A big part of that influence was was watching Jay, who was four years older. He was playing middle school basketball at that time, and uh, Irvin Johnson, who later became Magic, was his crosstown rival. So I would go and watch those guys play against each other, and really kind of sparked an interest in, in getting involved with, with playing from, from watching them too. 
Wow. Okay. So when you saw those guys go at it, uh, even before they became college teammates, you could probably tell that both were going to be uh, great players because Jay went on to have a, a great career in the NBA. Um, all rookie first selection, I think, in 1982 and uh, averaged more than 20 points and seven boards with the Mavericks in that first season. Um, could you tell straight away that these guys were going to be outstanding at the next level? Um, you know, I, I really at that time, watching both Jay and Irvin, never really thought about whether or not they would play professional basketball. It was really um, just purely the enjoyment of watching those two guys who were both, you know, six foot eight, you know, just real tall players uh, at young ages and, and really playing completely different styles of basketball on the court. Uh, it was entertaining. And um, the thought of where they potentially could go at that time wasn't wasn't something I thought about. It was just really great basketball games, big crowds and really fun to see the competition. In one article I read about you, uh, it said that your favorite sport, at least at that stage, was tennis. How good of a player were you uh, on the tennis courts? I was never a great tennis player. I was just always an admirer of the sport. You know, I appreciated the agility and the swings and the speed uh, and and really was a fan during that time of Pete Sampras and Andre Agassi and Bjorn Borg. And I mean, I just, you know, I enjoyed and connected with the game. You played for the Eastern Quakers uh, in high school in Lansing, Michigan. Um, you were dubbed Sir Slam, which was a nickname I actually wasn't familiar with before I started researching. And based on the photos I've uncovered since researching about your career, that doesn't surprise me. There's some great photos of you getting up for some big dunks. Um, just before we discuss your team's amazing run in 1980, uh, can you please just set the scene a little bit about your early high school career at Eastern? Yeah, well, I had prior to playing at Lansing Eastern, uh, played at, at Water French Middle School throughout Jay's Eastern High School career, again against Magic uh, at Everett High School. I would go to all of those games and, um, you know, I really enjoyed watching that Lansing Eastern team along with all the players. Just kind of gradually became a bigger, bigger fan of the sport of Lansing Eastern. And so coming into my uh, 10th grade year. Um, I had already had a pretty good education of what high school basketball was all about, having uh, followed Jay throughout the, the local uh, high school games and pretty much having followed Irvin even through the quarterfinals and the semifinals of, of the state competition. So coming in the Eastern, I was pretty well prepared as a, as a sophomore to jump right in and play. In terms of being around Irvin at at such a formative age and part of his career uh, when he's playing alongside and also uh, against your brother. Um, how much sort of interaction did you have with him and, and was he always such a, an outgoing and friendly guy as he so often appeared to be from the moment he pretty much hit the uh, college stage? Yeah, Urban was always uh, very passionate. Uh, it's one of the things I remember about him from the middle school days as a basketball player, he was a skinny guy, uh, very tall, um, obviously didn't have the skills that he later developed, but he always had the big smile. Mm -hmm. That was one of the things that, that really kind of drew me into basketball was the energy and excitement that both Jay and Magic uh, had during those middle school and high school years for the sport. It was clear to see that they just loved playing the game and competing and uh, were really excited about improving and getting better. And the state of Michigan has some fantastic fans as well, and uh, that's evident throughout the uh, many decades, of course, too. As I alluded to a moment ago, um, as a junior, your Quakers won the Class A state championship, and in the opening round district game, if I've got my stats correct, versus Everett, who I think is Magic's former high school team, uh, you were down by eight points with only a couple of minutes left in regulation and then reeled off six straight points to force overtime and also scored the first five points in overtime and ended up with about 31 points in a very stirring uh, six-point win. Um, what are your memories of that particular game? Because that was almost the stumbling block to what would be that 1980 state championship. Well, you know, I remember that being just an incredible matchup. Uh, there was a a real good basketball player named Craig Fields uh, that played on that team. And uh, Craig Fields and I were teammates a few years earlier on the Water French middle school team. So 
we knew each other real well. We were very competitive, very good friends. Um, but, but I, I lived in a different area and went on to play at Lansing Eastern and Craig went on to play at Lansing Everett. And, and I remember, uh, very well before that game, uh, Craig saying to me and to some of the fans that, you know, he knew my strengths. This was going to be the game that, that they won. And this was going to be the team that took us down. <laughs> and for pretty much <laughs> three and a half quarters, everything Craig said had pretty much came, came to, to fruition. But somewhere there in the end of that game, uh, I don't know, something clicked over and, and the will to just fight a little bit harder, you know, really popped in. And I was able to get uh, a little more late game confidence and, and make a couple shots. And then all of a sudden at the beginning of the overtime, uh, that, that confidence was still riding high. And it was a real important uh, game to give not only me, but our whole team the confidence that, that we could go on and win a state championship. And that's exactly what you guys did. Uh, in the semi-final of the state championship, you dropped 31 points and then went on to defeat uh, Highland Park at Chrysler Arena uh, and then won the championship game 64-53. to So I read that your Quakers finished the season 26-1 and and had 21 straight victories. Uh, in that final game, you had 16 points on just nine shots, which is excellent. Just in terms of that final game, also actually doubled as the first championship for Eastern since 1934, which I found to be an incredible little stat there. Um, what are your recollections of, of that semifinal and then also when you clinched that state championship? Well, it was an incredible run. Um, you know, everybody had a little bit of a, a target on our back. Uh, the year before, we had got to the quarterfinals, I believe, and, and, and really had a great season but lost somewhere in the run up to the state championship. And so coming back, you know, everybody wanted to beat us. They wanted to uh, not, you know, give us a chance to, to, to move on. So every single game was important. Uh, I think our coach, Paul Cook, uh, really did an excellent job that year of keeping the guys focused and really, uh, emphasizing team basketball, even though I was the guy that, you know, could score 30 points or could have a big night. Uh, we had some other real good players on that team and, on any given night, somebody else would step up and score 20 or 25. And I thought we did a good job of sharing the ball. And that was a, good, a real big key to our success that season. Do you remember how the region celebrated the state championship win and the following days and, uh, and how that felt to be part of a state championship winning team? Yeah, I remember it being an, an incredible feeling. Uh, I remember that semifinal game very well at Jenison Fieldhouse, uh, where I had a big game and, and really had a lot of nervous energy about getting out of the semifinal and then having a chance to get to Christ Arena and play in the finals. When we actually won that, that game, uh, it was really a well-balanced um, uh, team approach. There was a, a couple other guys in double digits and, you know, everybody got a chance to play and participate and and it was a great moment. Uh, it was something that, that, uh, I think not only the teammates and the coaching staff really enjoyed, but my family was there and Jay having had had his success, uh, and now at Michigan State, it was just, uh, it was a very special time. Yeah. Sounds fantastic. Now I'd just like to briefly touch on a couple of games from your senior high school season. Uh, the first of which was around Christmas time in 1980. You dropped 61 points on 28 of 38 from the field, including five dunks against a team called Waverley, and then that simultaneously eclipsed a city uh, scoring record that was held by uh, Irvin Johnson. I think he had 54 points. So reflecting on that particular game, what sort of springs to mind from that performance, Sam? Um, <laughs> it was a game where I think players often uh, refer to just being in some sort of zone. Mm. I was not aware really at any point during the game uh, how many points I had. Uh, it was definitely not a game that I went into thinking about, you know, anything other than winning. But at some point late in the game, I think uh, after I was past 54, uh, somebody, you know, alerted me to how many points I had. And uh, and at that point, you know, I scored a few more times. But I think the one thing that's never really mentioned is I didn't play in the fourth quarter of that game. So well. <laughs> right after getting the record, uh, Coach Cook took me out. And uh, you know, it was really not about chasing Magic's record. It was just one of those games where 
we were fast breaking. We were running. I was making shots and everything was just, uh, the stars were all aligned perfect. Yeah, that's an incredible performance. And just the second game I'd like to briefly discuss uh, was your final high school game. Probably a bit of a sore point, I guess, when you look at it. It was a triple overtime, one point loss, uh, 82 to 81. Um, just days prior, from what I understand, you were named the state's first Mr. Basketball. So do you mind just contrasting the highs of, of winning that first award and then also the lows of not being able to make it back to that state championship game to try and defend that title, Sam? Um, very disappointing. Uh, it was a, a very disappointing, uh, loss. I thought, um, our team obviously really fought hard. We played against a, a very competitive team out of Detroit who just would not, they just wouldn't give in. And having won the Mr. Basketball, um, award, uh, slightly before that and thinking I, you know, I'd have a chance to win a back to back at that time, uh, state championship was, was something that, that I was really excited about. So losing that game, uh, by a point was something that, uh, has always kind of, you know, you know, one of those things that you wish you could go back and have one less turnover or make one more free throw or do something a little bit different. But it, it really capped off a high school career that I'll always remember as a very special time in my life and, uh, really enjoyed the opportunity to play basketball during that period. Yeah. Well, it was an outstanding high school career for sure. You were named a high school All-American and in April of 1981 took part in the McDonald's All-American game at Wichita. Your West squad lost the game 96 to 95 to a Michael Jordan led East team. Uh, was this the first time that you had played against Jordan and how was the experience of taking part in a game with so many great players from across the country? That was my first time meeting Michael and Michael and I from that game, uh, became good friends and never really realized that we would have an intertwined um, future the way we've had. It was great being there uh, and having a chance to play with uh, Patrick Ewing and Aubrey Sherrard and Enos Watley, so many guys that eventually went into NBA careers and, and had successful both collegiate high school and professional careers. And I remember well, uh, prior to the beginning of that game, several people having a conversation about who would be the MVP of that game. And there were several guys mentioned. I think Greg Dryling you know, got a couple of votes and a kid named Anthony Jones from D.C. had a couple of votes. And I don't remember Michael uh, at that time getting any votes as, as someone who could possibly be MVP of that game. Okay. Uh, Michael came out, scored 30, and really just had an incredible McDonald's All-American game. And I think everybody left Wichita knowing that this guy was getting ready to have a fantastic basketball career. Yeah, it's fairly interesting that your careers, as you were saying, and lives would intertwine so many years down the track. And we'll certainly get to that a bit later. Um, earlier that same year, you actually held a press conference to announce that you'd be signing with the Michigan State Spartans. And it was unique due to the fact that your brother, Jay, who was a, a senior at the time with the Spartans, was there with you. And I found a great photo from the uh, archives online of that said press conference. Do you mind just talking a little bit about your memories of, of that particular press conference, what you can recall, and, and how special was it to actually have an older brother there with you to uh, help do that announcement? I remember uh, speaking to Jay quite a bit before making that decision, and and I was a little bit torn between Michigan State and the University of Michigan. Hmm. Uh, Coach Bill Frieder had really uh, spent quite a bit of time coming up and putting some extra pressure on in the recruiting battle. And I was kind of starting to change my mind and, and consider uh, the Wolverines. And I remember a conversation with Jay and, and him expressing how how much he enjoyed the student life at, at Michigan State and how great it was to be able to play at home in front of family and friends. And and then he said, and if you decide to go to Michigan State, I'm going to I'm going to come to your press conference. But if you go to University of Michigan, I'm not. So. <laughs> So I decided, you know, I, I might want to have him there. It might be kind of fun to have his support. So, okay, fine, I'll go to Michigan State. But in the end, I was really excited that I did. And and I had a chance to, you know, spend quite a bit of time around the Michigan State program, watching that 79 championship team and getting to know all the players and Coach Heathcote uh, prior to joining the team. And it just really made that whole eight years, uh, four years before coming to Michigan State and then four years after, uh, a very special time. Yeah, it's a really unique scenario, and uh, I'll include a photo 
from that press conference uh, in the show notes to this episode. So uh, our listener can have a look at that. And yeah, it's really a great photo with Jay uh, atop your shoulder. As you said, I guess uh, if you hadn't gone to Michigan State, he might not have even been in that photo. So that's quite amusing. <laughs> At Michigan State, you played three seasons with a couple of future NBA players, uh, Kevin Willis and Scott Skiles. Um, what was it like to play with those guys and, and how did the team begin to build itself back into becoming a, a Big Ten contender there, Sam? Well, it was fantastic playing with both Kevin and Scott. Again, none of us at that time knew what kind of careers we eventually would have leaving Michigan State. So we were just enjoying the time. And and when Scott came in in my sophomore year, uh, it was a welcomed addition to the team because he came with a lot of savvy and a lot of heart. And we became a backcourt uh, at Michigan State that really was a strong backcourt. Kevin Willis, uh, who had joined us from the Jackson Community College, was a young up-and-coming center uh, who was still developing his game, but but gave us a third player that we really felt was going to project us uh, into some real depth in the NCAAs. And I think we got some early rankings um, that sophomore, maybe junior year, uh, but we suffered a few injuries. Uh, we never really were able to live up to the expectations of what that team should have been able to uh, to accomplish. Uh, I appreciate you opening up about this. It's fascinating to to hear the sort of stuff from someone who was obviously right there involved in this as it was happening. As a senior, uh, you were named the team captain along with a guy named Richard Mudd. How much notice were you given about that honour ahead of the senior season commencing? I think... Going into that senior year, uh, Richard Mudd and I were uh, kind of the elder statesmen of that team. Kevin Willis had left. There were a couple other guys who prior to that year uh, were candidates, but but for some reason um, really just were not uh, interested in, in that type of role. So uh, it was something that, that we gave each of our players an opportunity to chime in and uh, nominate the guys that they wanted to represent them as, as team captains. So, uh, Richard and I were both, you know, really honored, uh, to be selected from our peers to be those team captains. And we took that responsibility serious. And, uh, and I think we both did a pretty good job that season. It was a, uh, a great season for the team. You made it to the NCAA tournament, which we'll get to in just a moment. Um, you actually started that same season on fire. You won 12 of the first 13 games and, at Purdue on January the 10th of 85, you had a massive game, had 39 points in a, a nine-point overtime win. Um, do you remember much about that particular game or just the, the hot streak to the start of that season? Well, I remember I remember us coming into that season really well prepared. We hadn't had the type of, of year before that we had hoped for uh, with Kevin Willis as a senior. And we were all a little bit down, a little disappointed, and I think everybody put a little bit more energy into their off-season preparation. So we got back to campus and and really put the, the hard work in, and we're really dedicated. and And I think that showed in the beginning. Uh, like you said, we got off to a great start. The team was playing well, and that specific uh, game at Purdue, uh, I remember having a very slow first half and for some reason um, just not playing well I think I might have had a little bit of a bug uh, but but I remember coach Heathcote at halftime came in and gave me one of those typical head banging Judd Heathcote moments <laughs> that became the inspiration in the second half to go out and play a whole lot better so it's a game that I'll always remember um, uh, it's something that I'll always remember coach Heathcote for because I really felt as a coach he was really special at understanding the variety of ways that you have to motivate players. And and he was really crafty at understanding the personalities on our team. And, and I think that went for the 79 championship team as well. And just being able to tap into to different guys' energies, different ways. And, and I thought he was masterful in that specific game because my second half performance uh, was able to propel us uh, to a real difficult win. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you scored at least 30 points in that second half. Um, when I was looking at a recap of a great game you played for the Bulls in 1988, I don't want to jump the gun, but uh, it said it was your best single half performance since this particular game in 1985. So you must have gone for about 30 plus. So a fantastic effort in uh, a big time game. Now, um, later that same season, you had a 10 point win at Indiana and 
that helped clinch the Spartans a berth in the NCAA tournament, and it was the first appearance since winning it all in 1979. Now, you had 31 points, made 11 of 11 free throws, had six rebounds and also five assists, so an outstanding game. And the Hoosiers coach, Bobby Knight, praised your performance afterwards. In the article, there was even a brief mention of how yourself and Scott Skiles were perhaps overlooked for the 1984 Olympic tryouts. And, of course, uh, Bob Knight was the head coach of Team USA. Um, what did you make of that particular win over the Hoosiers? And, and did you think much about the fact that you didn't get a look in for those trials? Well, I took the comment as a, you know, a real compliment coming from Coach Knight, who, you know, prior to me playing in that game, had spent time with Quinn Buckner, you know, Scott May, Isaiah Thomas. I mean, he had had a list of, you know, just incredible guards on his team. So I thought the compliment coming from Coach Knight was something that was much appreciated. Mm Mm-hmm. As it relates to the 84 trials and, and not having a chance to at least get to the trials, you know, that was a disappointing, that was a disappointing knock. But I think Scott and I both kind of felt like there were a lot of politics that went into those decisions and it wasn't always purely based on the performance of, of the players. Mm. And we both kind of felt like, you know, you know, by not getting that opportunity, it wasn't something that we hadn't done. So. I think the validation of his comments afterwards was something that both Scott and I appreciated. Yeah, for sure. Now, uh, in the tournament itself, the NCAA tournament, you had 32 points and six rebounds, and Scott Skiles added 15 points and he had eight assists, but you just dropped the game 70 to 68 to Alabama Birmingham. Um, now looking back on that game and, and just your college experience as a whole, uh, what sort of stands out most from, from that time in your life there, Sam? Just the opportunity to be connected to so many wonderful basketball experiences up to that point. It wasn't just the friendships and the camaraderie. Uh, it was also the competition. It was the relationships. Uh, so up to that point for me, I really had a chance to just reflect on how much the game had meant to me and how proud I was to be able to, to participate, play, compete on a high level and have had the success that I had. You've had some uh, great honors throughout your college career, and I'll just quickly reel off a few of these great achievements. You won the Big Ten scoring title as a senior, averaging almost 24 points a game. You were named all Big Ten first team as a junior and senior, and you were named most improved player in 85 for the Spartans team as well, um, plus a, a slew of other things that I haven't even mentioned. Um, now, you're currently seventh all-time in career scoring for the Spartans, one spot behind... Another guy named Vincent, your brother Jay. Um, do you ever sort of reminisce about your spots in the all-time scoring there, or that's just uh, something you don't concern yourself with too much? Um, Jay and I, from time to time, we will talk about the fact that as a brother combination, we were able to, uh, through all of the great players that have come through Michigan State, remain in the top 10 in scoring. And as recent as a few days ago, we've talked about just some opportunities to collaborate and really share our story um, because, of course, he had a story from 77 to 81 that included a championship and playing with Magic. Yeah. And I had a, a run from 81 to 85 that included playing with, with Scott and with Kevin. And, and so we feel like there's just some incredible stories around Coach Heathcote and the players and the championships and the Big Ten scoring championships. And at some point, uh, we will, we will collaborate and, and, and come up with, with a way to share some of those experiences in a way that, um, that it's, it's enjoyable for the, for the fans of Michigan State. Ah, oh, that's great. I really like the sound of that. It uh, sounds exciting. Heading into the 1985 NBA draft, you were picked 20th overall. Uh, by the Boston Celtics. Uh, that's the draft, of course, where Patrick Ewing went number one to the Knicks. Um, did you have any idea about teams that were interested in you or, or what were you doing in preparation for that draft day, Sam? Well, I had heard about a few teams uh, that were interested uh, and I had heard a range of anywhere from 13 to 20 uh, where I could go. And the interesting thing was, you know, in the draft, you never really know what's going to happen because it only takes one team to draft a player outside of what the uh, speculations were. And then all of a sudden the whole draft goes in a different direction. So 
I was on pins and needles. I did not go to New York to attend the draft. I was at my apartment watching my family. And obviously being called number 20th to the Celtics uh, was a day that, you know, I'll always remember. Very special time. And, you know, the beginning of, of that next chapter of, you know, something that had to that point just been very, very special in my life, but playing basketball. Now, the whole first round, was that actually shown on TV? So you got to hear your name called on the TV broadcast? Yeah, the whole first round was shown on TV uh, from my apartment when they called my name. Um, I was able to uh, see the video of my Michigan State career that they played. And then shortly after that, I got a call from the Celtics and, you know, just all of the details uh, surrounding what would happen next. So it was uh, a pretty incredible and special time. Um, how did you find that transition from being a college star to, to fighting for playing time on a roster that featured some of the all-time greatest players and just collectively one of the best teams of all time in the NBA? Well, it was an adjustment. Uh, it was a, a tough adjustment coming in, uh, having been a, a player that from high school to college had uh, been in a starting role and uh, in a pretty important scoring role. So now all of a sudden I was going up to that next level where all of the players there had been uh, well entrenched. They were all veterans and eventual, you know, Hall of Famers. Mm. Uh, so, so breaking into that situation was tough. Uh, that rookie year was just, uh, you know, a little bit frustrating because I didn't get the playing time that I was hoping for. I can only imagine how difficult that was. Um, there's not a lot that hasn't really been said, I guess, about the 1986 Celtics. You won the NBA championship, uh, in your rookie year. Uh, they went 67 and 15 and, uh, you lost only once through the Eastern Conference Finals. Do you have a story or any recollection of something that particularly stands out from your time on or off the court with the Celtics there, Sam? You know, there, Adam, there was a lot of uh, incredible memories, just a lot of incredible games and the travel. And, you know, there's been so many things that had happened before then and so many things after. Mm. But one of the things that really sticks out and stands out, there's probably a couple of things. Number one, the the very, very competitive practices that we would have at the Hellenic College, which Dennis Johnson and, and Danny Ainge and, and Larry and Kevin and, and Chief were the starting five, but with Jerry C. Sting and Scott Wedman and David Thirdkill and Bill Walton, we had a real competitive second team. And I, and I can just remember uh, being a rookie on that team and, and going home thinking, man, I get to play great basketball every day against great players and get paid. This is just the best thing in the world. It was a fantastic time, and it was a fantastic team. And The only other thing I really, really, just really as, a, as an incredible high point was the the actual parade at the end of the season uh, where we were able to go downtown and on the fire truck and, and with all the players and all the screaming fans and uh, record another Celtics championship. That was just uh, two just really incredible memories. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. I appreciate you um, reminiscing about those two. In mid-October of 1987, the Celtics traded you, along with Scott Wedman, uh, to Seattle. You had played 129 games for Boston. Uh, how did you first learn of the news of that trade to Seattle, and, and what was your sort of first reaction? Well, I got the news from Coach Jones. Uh, Coach Jones came in, and uh, we were actually at a game and he came to me prior to the beginning of the game, and I remember him saying that I wouldn't play that night uh, because the team had decided to make a trade and that uh, he felt it was, was something that would, would be in, in the best interest for me, being that I was a young player and really you know, wanting to play and be on the floor and, and just not getting those kind of opportunities in, in Boston. So it was a difficult period. I think, um, you know, there was two sides of, of feeling disappointed about leaving the situation I had got drafted to and the guys that I knew, but also a little bit of anticipation and excitement about going to Seattle where I knew Xavier Daniel, several of those players and, and felt that there might be a better opportunity to play. Yeah. I read somewhere along the way that you, uh, did a basketball clinic with, uh, Xavier McDaniel at some stage around this era as well. So you had a bit of a friendship with Xavier going back uh, a few years there. Yeah. Xavier and I both had signed with Spot Built Shoe Company. Okay. We had traveled around and done some, some clinics together and some, some youth development projects. And 
and I knew X a little bit from some of the all-star games uh, from high school and also from going out to Wichita State for a visit. So so I knew Xavier, knew he was a great player, and it was really a, a very nice welcome to be heading to uh, Seattle to play. I did see a photo from one of those clinics that you conducted with uh, X-Men, and uh, if I can find it, I'll definitely put it up on my Twitter feed to share with uh, listeners of the show. I would love to see that. I mean, <laughs> where you were able to find some of those... <laughs> pictures is is really a testament to your research abilities and your thoroughness around your guests because some of those pictures i hadn't seen in a long long time thank you very much yeah i love to uh dig deep into the archives online and see what i can find and um yeah i just love basketball history so any chance i have to to look into the uh history of somebody i'll do what i can in total you played 43 games with sonics the team was 27 and 26 You didn't have a lot of time to make an impact with Seattle, but what did you think of that short stay with the team? I enjoyed being in an environment where there were younger players, and I was able to immediately get in and get some playing time and and be a part of the eight-man rotation on that team. But unfortunately, uh, there was just, you know, some, some personality clashes, I think, at that time with Coach Biggerstaff, clearly... Uh, in retrospect, having uh, matured and, and had some time to reflect back on on that time and, and just kind of understanding how coaches are trying to put teams together. You know, there was some some philosophical differences that uh, just didn't work well. But, you know, with all due respect for, for Coach Bickerstaff, we were able to talk many years later and, and, and really, you know, kind of iron out some of the differences that, that we shared kind of during that time. And I have nothing but great respect for, for him as a coach and as a player and the incredible history he's been able to have in the NBA. Yeah, incredible longevity. And uh, again, I appreciate your openness and honesty. So thanks for that, Sam. Um, just prior to the NBA trade deadline in February of 88, Seattle traded you to the Chicago Bulls in, I think, pretty much a straight swap for Sadale Threat who was a guest on my show back in episode 12, uh, had a great conversation with Sadale. I read a really interesting quote from Jerry Krause, who at the time said, and I quote here, we're pleased to acquire Sam Vincent, who we've tried at various times to obtain in the last three seasons. Uh, looking back on that deal to the Bulls, what were you feeling when you first arrived in Chicago? Uh, excitement, a whole lot of excitement. Um, you know, I was getting a chance to, to join a team that had you know, one of the best players in the league playing. Yep. And, you know, obviously a young superstar. And, and I wasn't exactly sure how I fit it into that or where it was going, but I knew Michael and, and, you know, we had established a pretty good friendship and it was really exciting to be joining that team and, and thinking about having, having a chance to be in the backcourt with it. It really opened up your game as well. Um, now you rounded out that regular season starting in 27 of the 29 games, and your minutes per game almost quadrupled uh, from what you uh, had in previous seasons. And you averaged, I think it was 13 points and about eight and a half assists per game. Just before we chat about the 88 playoffs, um, can you just talk a little about your great play in Chicago and how you fit into that team as the regular season came to a close? Well, I think uh, one of the conversations I had with Michael when I first got there was around him saying that, you know, Chicago was a blue collar town. And if you came in and you played hard and you left it all on the court, that the team and the fans would really support you. I really tried to come in with that as my motto, that every every night I was going to go out and play as hard as I could and just kind of leave it on the court. And playing with, with Michael and with Scotty and Horace and uh, the guys that were on that team, uh, it was a younger team than what I was uh, used to in Boston, and we had great camaraderie. Uh, so it was just a very fun time. Uh, we had a great group. We had a lot of talent, and uh, we had a great coaching staff. We had Doug Collins as our head coach and, and Phil Jackson as an assistant. So it was really an enjoyable time. Fairly recently, some classic video footage uh, surfaced of a visit that you made to the Nike factory in Portland. It was back in late March of 1988, and you're in a limousine with Michael Jordan and Charles Oakley. Um, first of all, have you seen the clip? And if not, can you recall making a visit to that Nike store? Well, two for two. <laughs> I, I remember the day. It was, you know, one of those days you don't forget. 
Uh, and I have also seen the clip. I, I think someone either shared it with me or somehow I got posted on my Facebook. So <laughs> I did get a chance to see it. Was it a surreal experience or was it just something like you're just there with a friend, of course, but how do you sort of put that into context all these years later when you look back at rare footage like this, it just happens to come out and, and really just turn everybody upside down? Well, it was a very fond memory. It was in my early uh, days of just arriving to Chicago. And, of course, I knew Michael from uh, McDonald's All-American games that we had played in earlier. And so we had a friendship, but uh, had never really had the opportunity to uh, spend as much time together as, as we did when I got to Chicago. So I, I just recall one road trip out to Portland. We were on the West Coast, and I remember him saying that, that he had an opportunity to get over to the Nike factory and he was willing to take a couple guys along with him and was wondering if uh charles and i were interested in going and and you know this is my first trip to the nike factory so of course i wanted to go and see what it was all about but it was pretty incredible i mean you just kind of walk around with a cart and pick everything you want and then they told it up and put it in a bag for you so it was you know one of those rare experiences absolutely Ed, it's just great footage and in the show notes to this episode i'll include a link to the footage of that, it's just uh, to watch it some almost 30 years later, it's uh, yeah, it's really uh, eye-opening and uh, it might have seemed trivial at the time, but it's great to look back on all these years later. I must mention there's a particular game at Madison Square Garden in 1988 and you threw one of the great all-time alley-oops to Michael Jordan in a game against New York and in that same game, you actually had an equal career high of 17 assists. Uh, do you mind just talking us through that particular play and uh, your performance in that game, Sam? You know, everybody loves to play at the Garden. I remember at the beginning of that game, you know, spending a little time in the warm-ups with Michael and him saying he felt really good. And uh, I remember shooting the ball really well in the warm-ups. And, and, and there's always uh, electricity in the air when you're playing in New York. So at the beginning of the game, we were very excited. We were motivated and really charged to have a good game. And and that play uh, was not something that we thought about, but but Michael and I always had pretty good eye communication. So I remember getting the ball and, you know, coming up the left wing and just kind of catching Michael out of my right eye and automatically knowing, just get it in the air. <laughs> and when, once you do that, he's going to find it, he's going to track it, and he knows what to do with it. So <laughs> it became one of those plays that we talked about a lot, and, you know, something that um, just as a, as a point guard and a player, uh, it's always been fun to be con have been connected with him on that play. The crowd went absolutely insane, and that was the Knicks crowd <laughs> reacting to uh, your play, so it was uh, quite incredible. Now, I alluded to this a bit earlier. In the 88 playoffs, you met the Detroit Pistons in the Eastern Conference semifinals. That current rivalry uh, dated back to Jordan's rookie season. Um, the first two games were at Detroit, and then after dropping the first game, you needed to come through with a big second game. Uh, so I'll let you talk about game two, but I'll just set the scene by saying that you starred having a then career high 31 points and 27 of which were in the first half and also had five assists and guided the Bulls to a victory. Um, how did it feel to be back home playing such an outstanding game in a critical playoff performance? Um, well, obviously it was a fantastic feeling. I think coming into that game, we knew the pressure that we were under uh, to try to get a win. And at that point in time, we were still, you know, the underdogs to the Detroit Pistons. They were still the bad boys and they were going to rough us up and they were going to play tough and physical. And, and so, you know, we had read all the newspaper articles and we felt confident as a team, but we knew we had to come in and, and do something a little different. And I remember at the beginning of that game, um, Coach Collins saying, you know, hey, Sam, these guys are really going to be keying on Michael. They're going to really be sitting in his lap and, and, and hitting him and trying to make it difficult. So if you can get some things going early, it might open up the lane for him later. And so that's all it took was for him to make that <laughs> comment. And I said, sure, no problem, Coach. <laughs> that kind of gives me a license to go out and be a little bit more aggressive on the offensive end. And so the shot was falling. Uh, I was able to knock down a few jumpers earlier and, and got some real early confidence and uh, had a lot of support from home there. And, and again, it was one of my better uh, first half performances. 
And I was all ready in the second half to come out and do the same. But somewhere in the locker room around halftime, Michael said, hey, listen, you had a great first half, but make sure you pass in the second half. <laughs> so once I got that word from him, I knew uh, it was his turn to have a big second half. And I think he came out maybe half 40 in the second <laughs> half. You're pretty much spot on there. He ended up with 36 for the game. But he was scoreless in the first quarter, and that's when you did all the damage. You had 15 points and four assists, uh, according to a couple of newspaper articles I read, and were 11 of 13 from the field. So outstanding first half, and the Bulls were up by 15, I think, at half time. So a tremendous effort from yourself. I'd love to mention a game that was in December of 88 at Chicago Stadium. You held probably one of the best games of the season. Uh, you had 23 points and 11 assists against your former team, the Celtics, in a five-point win. Um, was it particularly satisfying to have such a great game against a former team? Were you using that as any sort of motivation or that's just how it turned out to be on the day? No, I think there was specific motivation to play well against the Celtics. You know, I, I think at every opportunity on some other team that I played against them, there was, there was a little bit of a burning desire to, you know, just to say, Hey, you know, um, you know, maybe if I had got a little bit more time to, finish developing as a player but but i was never envious of of the celtics i was always happy that they gave me that chance to go out and get more time and to play more so a little bit of a you know win-win kind of relationship i felt um you know in terms of being there and being a part of a first year nba championship team but also having the chance to leave and you know join another team where the players were younger and i had a chance to have a little bit bigger role even a modest fan of NBA history is familiar with the shot. Michael Jordan's series clinching jumper at Cleveland from the 1989 playoffs. Uh, of course, you're there as a member of the team watching this happen. Uh, what was going through your mind in the closing moments, just that final time out, and as the play unfolded to that incredible finish where it culminated with you guys all huddling on the court in celebration? I remember the timeout, and I remember Coach Collins uh, drawing up a play for, for Michael to either receive the ball or, uh, to initiate it kind of one on one at the top of the key. From there, everybody was just going to, you know, kind of clear out to the baseline. It was going to be an ISO play. I immediately felt good about the play call, about, you know, Michael's, uh, chances to, to score and to win the game. And as we got into the play and Michael got the ball, you know, Craig Elo, give him a lot of credit, was playing very tough defense, but Michael's hanging ability in the air just, you know, outlasted him and, and he got a real good look at the basket. And whenever Michael gets a good look at a basket, then, you know, there's a good chance it's going to go in. So just one of, you know, a million incredible plays that he's had over his, over his career. In the 1989 season, you averaged just under 10 points, three rebounds and five assists per game in only about 24 minutes of contest. Um, this was also the season where Jordan had that amazing run of triple doubles. He had seven straight, and I think it was 10 in 11 games. Um, do you have many memories of that particular season and then meeting back with the Pistons again, this time in the Eastern Conference Finals? I remember our team really evolving at that point. Uh, Michael was really, he was really becoming, you know, the bigger, broader superstar. Things, uh, I think, uh, around Scottie Pippen and Horace were starting to take some shape at that time. And I think, uh, prior to that, a lot of the penetration and mid-range game that, that I had been playing successfully, uh, the year before started to change and having more space, uh, on the floor and really going to the guys like John Paxson and Craig Hodges that, that really could give Michael the room to, to get to the basket and then, you know, be those deep three point range, uh, threats, uh, started to kind of change some of, of, of my playing time. But uh, I remember it really being a time that the team continued to improve and some solid pieces were being put in place. And there was a lot of growth on the team, which, which was obviously leading up to, you know, some of those incredible Bulls championships that they, that they later won. In mid-June of 89, the Orlando Magic would select you in the NBA expansion draft. Um, what do you recall of becoming an original member of that Magic franchise and, and making the move to Florida? Uh, I remember being excited about leaving the cold weather. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I thought at that time that that was exciting. 
when I reflect back now, I realize I would have traded the warm weather for a couple more championship rings. Uh, Understandable. <laughs> but, you know, um, Orlando Magic was coming in as a new team, and it was an opportunity to, again, uh, play inside of a system where I would get more playing time. So, uh, of course, that was exciting. I was also having a chance to sign, you know, what turned out to be a little bit bigger contract. So I was pretty motivated and looking forward to, to the opportunity to get to Orlando. Uh, even though again, I look back and I think, man, I, I missed the opportunity to play on some great Bulls teams that, that later went on to win a string of championships. I'm not telling you anything you don't know, of course, but you weren't far removed from that magical run they started to encounter. So you just missed it by a season or two there, which is really, uh, unfortunate in retrospect. You spent three seasons with Orlando. I'd love to briefly ask you about a particular game that took place in February of 1990. It was Valentine's Day, and your former team, the Bulls, were visiting the arena. Um, Michael Jordan's famous number 23 jersey went missing, uh, inverted commas, missing, pre-game, and he was forced to wear jersey number 12, and your Magic won a thrilling game in overtime, probably one of the best wins of this first season for the team. Just a quick side note to this game, NBA Hoops would release two versions of your 1990-91 player card. Um, the first one was soon deleted as the photo showed Jordan in the number 12 jersey. First of all, what do you remember about that great win over the Bulls? I think it was a six-point win in overtime. Uh, and have you actually been told the real story behind why that first player card of yours was quickly replaced? <laughs> That's a long-winded question. but <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll make it a little bit shorter with my <laughs> response. Uh <laughs> I do remember that game. Uh, it was a game that I was very excited and eager to play. And I remember getting off to an incredible first half. And the first half was so good that at the beginning of the second half, uh, John Paxson was no longer guarding me and Michael was. So <laughs> I knew at that point that, that Phil had said, Hey, somebody's got to get over there and guard Sam. So <laughs> I remember that very well, but, but I also remember Jersey number 12 as a result of his jersey being stolen right before the game. Apparently one of the eager fans was able to get into the locker room and and, and get away with his jersey. Uh, shortly after that, when they started creating the cards, I think it was somebody from the Jordan camp that called in and said, hey, wait a minute, you know what? Uh, this <laughs> this <laughs> Sam Vincent card with Michael in is just not going to work. So... Uh, even though I enjoyed the card and, and had a lot of people anxious to get it, um, there was a call made and the card was terminated. That's an interesting backstory there. And, uh, yeah, thanks for elaborating there. Um, I was collecting the cards at the time over here in Australia and, uh, managed to snag the first one and the replacement card. So they hold pride of place in that, uh, set from that season. <laughs> um, now your last season as a player was 1992 and then the magic traded you to the Milwaukee Bucks, which I actually wasn't aware of in August of that year, but I believe you had an Achilles-related injury which pretty much put an end to your playing career. I will say that uh, the end of the playing career uh, did take place via an injury in Milwaukee. Uh, I went up for a jump shot in the corner against Gary Payton uh, in a preseason game in Spokane. Uh, came down and, and tried to turn and run up the court and snap my Achilles. And that was during a time where the technology around that specific injury was not as, as sharp as it is today in terms of, you know, recovery and rehab and just kind of getting back on the court. So uh, I had the surgery and, and developed some real bad scar tissue as a result of the injury and, and just was never able to get the same uh, spring in my left leg. So, so I lost a lot of the speed and I lost a lot of agility and, and my jumping and uh, decided to go overseas. Uh, as a result of that, communicating with my agent, I was able to land a playing opportunity in uh, Thessaloniki, a team called Aris over in Greece. And really from that experience, just realized that trying to get back to the NBA with the diminished in speed and, and jumping that I had was going to be really a, a real tough challenge. So that short-lived international career was was where I ended up uh, finishing my, my basketball. Okay, so I wasn't actually aware of the uh, the stint in Greece. How long were you playing over there for, or how many games did it take before you started to realize, well, this probably is not going to happen? 
I ended up playing the whole season. Okay. Got through it, and, and, I, and I had pretty good stats. I averaged about 17 points a game, and I was on that team with Sean Higgins from the University of Michigan, and, and we actually had a good team and did well. Okay. But but I just never felt like the the strength and the stamina and the endurance had, had got back into the leg and, and, and tried to push it a couple of times, but just never got back to a comfortable playing point. I didn't actually know about that, so that's good to hear that you uh you tried to extend the career overseas and, and possibly look to come back to the NBA, but it just didn't quite happen that way. This whole other area of your career after your post-playing days is absolutely fascinating, and we could probably have a massive conversation just about this alone. So we might jump back and forward a little bit in the timeline, but I've tried to put it in chronological order. Um, I was certainly aware that you'd coached overseas after finishing your playing days, but I wasn't aware to the extent of how much that was until I started to fully research your career. Uh, it's very vast and you've traveled all over the world. What first led to the opportunity to head to South Africa and coach the uh, Cape Town Kings, I believe, in around 1996 SM? Well, I remember um, a very short stint uh, at Disney during the period that they were starting the uh, new sports complex, uh, I was working there with a gentleman named Reggie Williams, who was the vice president of sports, had jumped on that staff with the responsibility of recruiting uh, sports events to come down and participate at the new field. And I was there maybe, I don't know, four or five months. You know, I enjoyed the whole Disney experience and being a part of, the, of that cast. But uh, there was something that I just, you know, continued to miss about basketball, being on the court working with players, just staying connected to the game. So uh, I ended up traveling down to South Africa to really do some research on where basketball was and how the sport was doing and to kind of find out if I had, you know, land an opportunity to be involved. And I met with the owner of the Premier Basketball League, a guy by the name of Al Feinstein. And, and Al at that time said that there was eight teams in the league, but they were interested in expanding. And if I wanted to get involved, not only could I be there as a as a coach, but I could be there as an owner. Oh, okay. So I ended up purchasing a franchise in that league, and uh, and that's what really started my coaching career. I coached the team. I was the general manager. Um, uh, kind of did A to Z basketball operations. Wow. And stayed there for about three years, specifically just kind of you know getting through the nuts and bolts of running a team. That's incredible. So how how did you go with the transition of being a former player to then wearing all these multiple hats at the same time? Well, I, I, I didn't find it too much of a struggle. Uh, I think the time that I spent uh, in the corporate environment at Disney was a different kind of world. It was a different kind of responsibility, and, and I missed the game. So I think after doing that for about six months, um, it really opened my eyes up to how much I missed being around the sport and how much I, I still thought I had to offer. Uh, so even though when I went down to South Africa and, and, and got involved, I was doing a lot of things. It didn't feel like work to me. I mean, it just, it was pure joy to be back around basketball and back on the court and, and, you know, participating in a game. You were there for about three seasons or so with Cape Town Kings. And then I believe even at the end of that time, you also became head coach of the men's and women's South African national teams. Just some great progression there from one to the next. And was it long before taking over those roles that you then returned back to Greece and also over to the Netherlands as well to do some more coaching? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, after you know working with the Kings for a while, like you mentioned, I, I started working with the national teams. And I was in Alexandria, Egypt, for a, a African tournament that uh, we as South Africa was playing in against Nigeria. Uh, and not only Nigeria, but all the other African countries, Egypt and Mozambique and Congo, Cameroon, they were all there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember having a conversation with somebody in the Nigerian delegation who had mentioned that they were, you know, you know, happy to see how much success I was having with South Africa, who, which was really not that very talented of a team. And they were interested in, in having some conversation with me at some point if I was ever interested in coaching a team with a little bit more talent. And so I said, sure, I would, you know, always welcome coaching a team with a little bit more talent if, if the opportunity was right. And about a year later, I stepped out of uh, South Africa and started coaching the uh, Nigerian team. And, and then from there, you know, of course, I had a chance to coach their men and women as well. 
great experiences. And a majority of those things I wasn't even aware of until started doing a bit of a deep dive into what you've achieved. You also were um, involved in the 2004 Olympics, if I'm not mistaken. Yep, that's correct. We won the 2003 African Women's Championships in Maputo, Mozambique. And at that time, the Mozambique women team had uh, several WNBA players. It was a very hot, heat-contested game and a uh, um, brand-new facility there in Mozambique. Probably had about 10,000 fans inside watching, which completely surprised me. Yeah. But I had a young player named Mfong Udoka who had played at DePaul and, and, and also played in the WNBA and Mac DeBid Amakri. And uh, after some very tough games and then a finals against uh, Mozambique, we were able to secure the African Championship, which got us a qualification into the Olympics 2004. What an incredible run there. And uh, and what did you make of that Olympic experience? The Olympic experience was, was pretty incredible. Uh, staying in the Olympic Village, having a chance to, uh, with our credentials, go and watch all of the other sports and get to know a lot of the other athletes. Hmm. It was truly an amazing experience, something that at the time, uh, of course, I, I valued and appreciated, but but I appreciate it so much more now afterwards because it was a very big Olympic game that it had moved back to Greece for the first time since the beginning. Uh, it was a great game. It was a great experience. And, you know, something that, um, you know, I, I kind of think to myself, Adam, I would love to have that opportunity one more time. So I'm trying to figure out how to get to Tokyo in 2020. Oh, fantastic. Well, definitely we'll keep a close eye on, on how that progresses. Now, also incredibly in and around these overseas experiences, you also managed to find time to lead uh, NBA D-League team to the championship in 2003. The Now, correct me if I'm wrong with the pronunciation. It's Mobile, Mobile Revelers. That was uh, Mobile. Mobile, oh, gee. I, knew, I had a 50-50 chance. I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What was that like? Because I wasn't even aware that you had the involvement with the D-League at that stage. So forgive my ignorance there, but I'd love to hear more about uh, how that sort of came to be and how did that sort of contribute to to these coaching philosophies that you'd have and, and probably still have to this day. Well, I remember connecting with uh, Kim Bahuni, who was a senior uh, vice president with the NBA somewhere in the world. I'm not even sure where, <laughs> but I remember us having a conversation and her saying that the NBA was getting ready to start a minor league and they were going to be starting their first batch of teams out in the Southeast. And I should reach out to a guy named Rob Levine and go through the interview process and see if I could get one of the jobs, which of course I did and ended up getting the mobile job. And, uh, at that time, uh, we had Alex English, Nate Archibald, uh, Rob Thornton. So we had several other uh, NBA players that were connected to the D league at that time. And, just really excited to be able to connect to something that I've been talked about for a long time uh, in terms of creating the minor league for the NBA and, and us being the, you know, some of the pioneers in terms of having the first opportunity to, to kick it off. So that was a great experience. Some great coaches uh, that first year in Mobile. Um, we got to the semifinals where we lost to Alex English and the Charleston Logators. And then the next year, we added Isaac Fontaine and, and one other kid, Derek Hood. And that just really kind of took us over the top. We had a great year, and I was able to win a championship that second season at Mobile. Wow, just fantastic memories there to look back on. And uh, when you hear these sort of things mentioned back to you, are you surprised in any way about and the breadth and depth of what you've done coaching-wise, or is it sort of something that you just take in your stride and you continue to see what's next and what's coming up ahead? Well, no, you know, actually I do. I often think, I, I don't know how I had the time to do all the things that I did. I don't, I don't know how I fit it in. Geographically, there's a lot of different countries I was in, a lot of different teams I was working with. And uh, I think during that period, I was just kind of grinding it out. I was working, you know, kind of straight through the fall into the summer, just kind of year round coaching. And, you know, I really appreciate it now because I feel like it has created some real depth. I sometimes try to figure out if that's going to lead me back into, you know, more coaching opportunities or, you know, writing a book to tell some of the stories about some of these incredible opportunities. Um, but, but I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to, you know, work with all the players that I had a chance to work with and to coach all the teams because they were all really incredible experiences. Absolutely. And for brevity, I'll 
going to have to skip a few things along the way here. Otherwise, we'll be here for another hour or so. But uh, I really enjoy uh, hearing you talk about this. So thanks again for making yourself available. Uh, now, you were back in the USA for the 2007 NBA season and you were an assistant coach for the Dallas Mavericks. Now, that year, the Mavs went 67-15, and 15, uh, number one seed in the playoffs before a shock first-round exit to the number eight seed Golden State Warriors. Um before you actually even just chat about that playoff series, what do you remember about that first season coaching in the NBA? Man, it was a it was a fantastic year. Um, you know, having a chance to work with with uh, Avery Johnson uh, and Joe Prunny and Dell Harris, all pretty reputable, solid coaches, was uh, fantastic for me. I think that team was a very talented team. You know, headed up by by Dirk Nowitzki, uh, and we had a fantastic year. I think I grew a lot as a coach. Um, you know, uh, Coach Avery develops a lot of his coaching schemes behind Greg Popovich because he spent a lot of time there and won a championship with Popovich. So I felt like I got a little insight into Avery, but also a little bit into Popovich in terms of defensively how they focus and, and offensively how they set things up and how they manage players. Mm. So so that was a great experience. Really enjoyed it. Kind of wish sometimes I had stayed a little bit longer than the one year, but you know, how do you turn up a head coaching opportunity? So that kind of led to something else. Absolutely, it did. And, uh, we've discussed obviously your links back to Michael Jordan. They're going back to as far as 1981 at that McDonald's High School All American game. Now, after you worked that season as an assistant with the Mavs, MJ brought you in as head coach of the Charlotte Bobcats for the 2008 season. Um, this is a, yeah, just a fascinating period of time that, uh, I'd welcome any observations you'd like to make about this. How did that opportunity come to be? Of course, you've got that storied history of knowing MJ for that long, but clearly he saw plenty you knew that made him pull the trigger on bringing you in as the head coach. That's true. I got a call from Michael. Uh, Michael said, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to be making a coaching change uh, at the end of the year. I'm sure you remember Bernie Bickerstaff was the coach at that time. And, Absolutely. Uh, and he said, um, you know, I'm interested in, in talking to you, and then you go through the interview process with a few other people. Are you interested? Uh, of course, I'm interested. Um, you know, I think every every assistant coach's dream is to be the head coach in the league, and to have the opportunity to connect with Michael and be there in Charlotte was like a dream come true. So, so yeah, it was it was an incredible opportunity and something that you know will always, no matter how things went, will always be one of my best basketball memories. For sure. In that one season with the Bobcats, you went 32 and 50, and after that, do you mind just perhaps chatting about the subsequent years that followed, uh, some of the opportunities that you had along the way? Well, after the Bobcat season, I ended up getting a call from Michael, and Michael, you know, you know, said kind of based on a variety of different reasons, uh, felt it was the best move to make to go a different direction, which was obviously a tough decision for me at that time. I thought we had a pretty good year that first year with 32 wins and with a very mediocre team. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I understood that's the business and a lot of things go into that. So immediately following that year, I um, went out and coached in the D league just to kind of stay involved with the game. I coached the team on Anaheim. I uh, had a pretty good year there, had a couple of NBA guys that I was able to develop. Uh, and then from there, uh, got back involved with, with national team coaching. Uh, Coached the Jamaica national team, spent some more time coaching um, in Nigeria uh, with the men and women team, and then uh, headed off and most recently uh, coached in the Middle East for three years. At that point, my interest was really just trying to stay in, stay in touch with the game and continuing to coach. Thanks again for um, elaborating a bit further there about the end of your time there with the Bobcats. I didn't want to press too much, so anything you're willing to to say is uh, appreciated. Um, now, I read that uh, in 2015, you led a team to the Bahrain League Championship. I probably will butcher the pronunciation, so do you mind just saying what the name of the team was? Uh, it was the Al Manama Club. Uh -huh. And how was that experience there? And I've seen as recently as only in the last few weeks some photos of you online where you're wearing a T-shirt that actually also says the name of that. Is it Al, Al Manama? Yeah, Al Manama. You know, it was a fantastic experience. Prior to taking the job, I had a lot of people say that, you know, it was a tough uh, region to coach in, uh, that the players were really undisciplined, and uh, that I wouldn't enjoy uh, the specific team that I was going to. But, you know, I, I kind of saw all of that as a challenge. 
and decided to go ahead and take the job. And, and I can honestly say that, you know, I really enjoyed being in Bahrain. The Middle East was fantastic. Uh, the players there, you know, like any team, you're going to have some things that you got to work on and some adjustments you got to make. But by the end, uh, I feel like I had a good team. We were successful. I enjoyed those three years. Uh, just kind of rounding out and, and, and having a chance to coach in an area that was new to me. Now in the second half of last year, you returned to the helm of Nigeria's women's team and led them to the 2017 AfroBasket title. So you mentioned uh, your links to Nigeria commenced in the early 2000s. So to return back and lead the team to that victory, how was that experience for you? And um, do you mind us elaborating a little bit more on that? Well, it was a little surreal. Um, I got a call from M. Fong Adoka, who was one of my players on the team on that 2004 Olympic team. And, and I hadn't really been connected to the team over, you know, several years. Mm -hmm. And M. Fong told me that they were having some issues with the coaching staff they had considered and they needed someone who, you know, understood Nigeria, uh, and had some sort of feel for coaching in Africa and what it would take. And speaking on behalf of the Federation, she was wondering if I'd be interested. And I told her, you know, uh, yeah, under the, the right circumstances, um, I had a good time um, previously coaching Nigeria, even though this was a whole different set of women. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was willing to take it on. So I took the job. Uh, we were a little bit behind in our preparation and training period. But once we got to Bamako, Mali, all of the members of the team really huddled up real tight and our chemistry was great. And we were really, you know, determined and focused to go out and play our best and see if we could win the tournament. And, you know, I can honestly say it was a great tournament. Our team was 8-0. Uh, we didn't lose any games. We qualified for the World Championships in Spain uh, this September. It was fantastic being able to reconnect with the country, the Federation, and, and once again lead those ladies to an, an African championship. Fantastic stuff. And what time frame do you see that the preparation for the – championships later this year will start to really kick into high gear uh right now we're looking at sometime middle of may as the beginning of training and that'll carry on through june and we'll look at some of the uh, potentially new players uh and then in july we'll round our team out uh in august we'll uh, be involved in a series of competitive games in a few different countries uh, and then early September, we'll start uh, with a small series of events in Nigeria. And then by uh, mid-September, we'll be uh, we'll be in Spain. Yeah, well, so yeah, time will certainly be upon you before you even know it. So uh, all the best with that. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Now, as recently as a few weeks ago, uh, you were in New Delhi, India, promoting the game of basketball. Um, actually, before I even go further, have you ever been to Australia before in terms of coming out to do anything with the game? No, I have not had a chance to, to reach Australia, but, but I have been working with a gentleman named Sandeep Singh, uh, who has, uh, some pretty extensive relationships in Australia. We've been talking about forming some partnerships to come out and do some clinics or work with some coaches. So that is something that I'm pretty excited and eager to do and hoping will happen sometime soon. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. I'd like to hear that. So, uh, if that ever does happen and, I'm anywhere within a few hours of where you're going to be. I'd love to um, have a chance to meet you. Um, in terms of New Delhi and you're, you're all, all around the different countries promoting the game of basketball, two words that are often associated with yourself, and I'm sure it's no coincidence, global coach, uh, that's most apt. What do you hope that Global Coach International can achieve? Well, I formed the name Global Coach, um, you know, honestly, just because of the variety of countries that I've had a chance to be connected with and coach in. And in each of these areas, you know, the primary responsibility is always the professional team that I'm working with, but there's always a secondary responsibility to work with the youth teams and to try to develop some of the youth coaches and some of the younger players. And so just kind of in that capacity, I really started to move more in that space of considering myself global coach as it relates to having a chance to work with players, you know, all around the world and share, you know, some of the, you know, just some of the real key principles that I've learned from some of the incredible coaches that I've worked with and some of the incredible players to help players develop their game and to understand how hard you have to work to be good and, you know, some of the things that will help you along the way. So, so now, 
in this partnership with the AAU, we form what we're calling the AAU Global Coach Academy. And it's really just in partnership with the AAU, my opportunity to reach out to different federations, different coaches, different players, different clubs, and come in and try to share, you know, what, what I believe are some incredible experiences to, to help players, like I said, improve their game and become the best players they can be. A great mission there and uh, wishing you continued success with that. Uh, it'd be remiss of me not to ask the following, given that you're only 54, um, would you entertain an opportunity to re-enter the NBA or, or college coaching ranks? I know you'd mentioned that you'd like to get back to the Olympics as well or perhaps you know write a book or whatever the opportunities might present themselves, but would an NBA... Uh, position again get some serious consideration from yourself yes it would yes it would um i feel like um you know the whole bobcat situation was something that you know all coaches get fired so it's, it wasn't something that i couldn't believe happened um but it was it was a little bit of a tough time for me so i really just kind of wanted to be away from uh that level for for a bit and and i can honestly say i feel like the time that I spent away and working in the international space and developing, you know, some of some teams around the world has been very positive for me. But now if there was an opportunity to get back to the NBA and work with a team and help develop, you know, some of the young players, that that's something I would welcome doing. Yeah, I truly hope that uh, certainly is on the horizon for you if that um, does present itself. Uh, just a couple quick questions to round things out. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show and, and chat with you for this period of time. Uh, just before we get to those questions, is there anything else from your international coaching career that you'd like to add or elaborate further on? Well, you know what? Nothing, Adam, actually from the international side, but, but there is something I would like to touch on. You know, there, there was, uh, sometime after being released from the Bobcats, there was an article that was written in, uh, I think the Washington Post or the Washington Times that I really felt uh, misquoted me as it related to some comments around Michael and the journalist at that time. I'm not sure what his angle was. Uh, maybe he had a little bit of a beef with Michael from his Washington days or something, but he really kind of moved me into a question that I thought was, was a little unfair. And the question really was kind of around whether or not I thought uh, Michael wanted to be as good of an owner as he was a player. I still honestly believe that that's, you know, that that's a little bit of a personal question for, for Michael because, you know, for, for Michael to be the player that he was, which was to me the best player ever to play, mm -hmm. that took a lot of energy. It took a lot of focus. It took a lot of drive and uh, it took a lot to accomplish that. And then whether or not his focus, his drive, his energy uh, to be an owner is in the same capacity um, that's only something Michael can answer. And so my, my response to the journalist was, you know, I don't, I don't know that that's a question you have to ask Michael, whether or not he feels like he wants to reach those same heights as a, as an owner. But the story was misquoted and it's something that has really kind of been out there and, and been a little bit of a negative. And, you know, I would never question Michael's energy, his drive, his focus to be the best. Uh, that's who he is. He wants to be the greatest in whatever he does. And surely I would never question that. That That's what I know him to be. Um, but but I really felt the way the question was asked and the way it was framed up was a little bit inappropriate. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm glad that you've had a chance to uh, elaborate on that. And hopefully that certainly can get any uh, misconceptions based on how it was printed, uh, clarified for sure. Um, Basketball Digest had a regular feature that's called The Game I'll Never Forget. Now, there's a fair chance we probably already covered it in one way, shape, or form, but is there one game from your career, either a player or coach, that stands out above the rest? Oh, man. <laughs> That's putting you on the spot, isn't it? <laughs> man, yes, man. Man, there's, there's so many. There doesn't have to be one. You don't need to choose one, but I just was curious if there was one. There, there's a lot, but, but if there is one game that I would talk about, that I had to kind of single out, it would probably be the Eastern Conference against the Detroit Pistons in game two. Uh, we went into Detroit and we had gotten beat up in game one and, you know, we were really trying to make a dent in this series and see if we could kind of turn the tide and 
and get past the Pistons that year. I remember, you know, Coach Collins having a very, very spirited pregame chalk talk. And in that first half of that game, just really played extremely well. And I remember that game so well because Michael came up to me and was like, hey, man, you had a good first half, but let's make sure you're passing the ball a little bit more in the second half. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) I think I ended up with 31 points for that game. It was an incredible game, an incredible memory. We did win that game, although we lost the series. Uh, and out of all the games, that one just kind of stands out because I was at home uh, in Detroit uh, against Isaiah in the Easter Conference, and it was just a big game. Obviously, it's a, a good one that does come to mind quite quickly. Um, just a, a quick side tangent based on that response. You had uh, Doug Collins as your head coach, and you had Phil Jackson behind the scenes as well as an assistant. Um, it wasn't too long after... You'd left the Bulls that Phil, of course, took over the uh, head coaching job with the Bulls and then led them to that incredible run of success. Um, how do you sort of compare and contrast uh, a Doug Collins versus a Phil Jackson? I guess obviously Doug wears his heart on his sleeve, no doubt. Um, but what did you make of the comparison between those two guys, SM? Well, I thought, uh, I thought both Doug and Phil were, were great coaches. I thought Doug was a great coach who had been uh, a very brilliant player and really was bringing a lot of the player emotions and a lot of that uh, just kind of raw, genuine connectivity to his coaching style. And I thought Phil was very much different. I thought Phil also was a good player, but was a lot more uh, systematic in his thought process and uh, a lot more strategic uh, with his emotions and his delivery. I think just because of that, um, you know, he probably handled the team a little bit different, and, and I think the players related to him a little bit different. Gotcha. Um, thank you for uh, opening up about that. Now, the final question I'd like to ask, and this one does elicit some different responses depending on uh, the significance, but did you have any particular significance to the jersey numbers that you wore during your career? Uh, at Easton, I believe you wore number 44 and maybe 45 on the road. I'm not sure. Uh, Michigan State, you had number 11 and then you wore number 11 throughout your NBA days. Um, any particular significance to those numbers, Sam? Uh, well, Jay, Jay, my older brother and Magic were really my, uh, early inspiration to playing, uh, basketball, um, in Lansing, Michigan, where, you know, I grew up and, and my brother Jay, uh, was a, same year as Magic and, and both six foot eight, six foot nine players and, and having some incredibly heated, contested battles, uh, at the high school level, uh, they kind of created this, you know, motivation for me to play. So, uh, when I started playing four years later at Eastern High School, I wore my brother Jay's number 44. And that was really kind of the reason why I chose that number was because it was his number at Eastern as well. Mm-hmm. And, and then, uh, as I got through my collegiate days, I was really a little bit more of an Isaiah Thomas fan with number 11 ah. and the way he played with the Detroit Pistons. That really became where I landed on number 11 and kind of stayed with it. Right. Okay. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's intriguing, particularly given that, uh, you'd be a member of the Bulls around the time where the, the bad boys sort of reputation was almost at its heights. Uh, how was your interaction with Isaiah either on or off the court in terms of just Detroit in general? Uh, you know, the relationship was always good. You know, uh, Isaiah was very close to Magic and, and by that time, uh, Magic had left Michigan State, went to the Lakers, you know, won the NBA championship in his rookie season and had formed these real close bonds with a lot of the NBA guys like Isaiah, Mark Aguirre, Daryl Dawkins. And these guys would come to Lansing and, and we would play during the summertime. So. I had developed a real close relationship with Isaiah. I knew him. We were pretty good friends. And that made uh, picking number 11 and wearing it because of Isaiah uh, really, you know, really easy to do. Thanks for sharing that. Always fascinates me to see what a player might come back with for the reason. Sometimes it's just, oh, that's the only number that was available and I, I kept it for the, my career. But other times there's some really good stories behind the scenes. Uh, now, Sam, it's been fantastic to have you on the show today. Thanks again for chatting with me for this period of time. And I wish you all the best in no matter what direction you go with with your coaching career going forwards. But uh, just thanks again for, for having a chance to chat with me. Well, Adam, it's been a pleasure. I enjoy 
reading your post and, and following your site. So again, a pleasure being on. I wish you the best and look forward to speaking to you again sometime down the road. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. You can suggest topics or guests you want to hear conversations with. Leave a voicemail. Simply visit inallairness.com slash voice. Click start recording. Leave a message and press stop. You can even listen back before submitting. Press send and you're done. Worldwide, the show currently has 73 reviews, 70 on iTunes and 3 on Stitcher. Thanks for your continued support. If you add a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are certainly one of the best ways that you can support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. Word-of-mouth recommendations are worth their weight in gold. Stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my monthly email newsletter. You'll receive exclusive details on upcoming podcast episodes, future high-profile guests to appear on the show, and much more. Simply visit inallairness.com slash news. You can subscribe to my show in various ways. Apple Podcasts, visit inallairness.com slash iTunes. Android, visit inallairness.com slash Android. Add it to your Stitcher playlist, inallairness.com slash Stitcher. You can now subscribe to the show on Spotify, Plus, Pocket Casts, Player FM, TuneIn Radio, other podcatchers, and of course, via the Podcasts app on your iOS device of choice. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show.